let's go for something that's fun and entirely non-controversial. So let's talk a little bit about AI and large language models. And wow. Wow. I like you. You're as cynical it's, as I am. That's, that's a good sign. That's a good sign. Um, so uh, obviously, this is, this is the current hype kit on the block. And, and if you want to double your salary, add AI to your title. And uh, it, it's hilarious to watch the, the self-description of, of companies. And every company on Earth has an AI angle to their story as of this year. It is yeah. amazing. Uh, but what I find so interesting is this idea that Gen AI is going to be the end of, you know, insert whatever, end of programmers, the end of authors, the end of movie creators, the end of so many jobs. So you are going to be replaced by an AI model. Finally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I, I don't know. I, I hate the hype. Uh, at the same time, I think AI is very interesting. I, yeah. When I went to university, we were still talking about rule-based expert systems and Bayesian logic and, and all of this kind of thing. And it, it was called AI, but it was not in any way intelligent. Uh, and, and I do think that the last few years have Neither been interesting. Neither is today's. Yeah. But uh, I... I don't want to be part of the hype. Yeah. And uh, I will say that the AI revolution has had, even on the kernel level, uh, a few positives. For example, uh, a company like NVIDIA, who is not exactly famous for being great at, at interacting with the kernel community, has actually been much more active and, and been involved in the Linux memory management code because suddenly they start caring about Linux when, when they are selling a lot of AR hardware. Mm -hmm. I mean, it used to be crypto and, and uh, it's still obviously GPUs and, and it's being used in, in big servers and running Linux. So it has actually had a positive impact, but my personal opinion is let's wait 10 years and see where it actually goes before we make all these crazy announcements of your job will be gone in five years. Well, I think we already see lasting and, and almost irreversible change happen, happening through many of these AI tools, not on the hype gen AI front, but just at the, in the tools that make our lives better and easier. I, I keep calling it autocorrect on steroids and people are mad at me, but the, if, if you use a an, an, uh, Gen AI and hopefully an SLM tool uh, to help you with, with basically code completion in your editor, isn't that a, a, a huge opportunity? So I'm, I'm actually, I mean, I'm one of those people who are very optimistic in, about AI, and I'm looking forward to the tools to actually find bugs. We have a lot of tools tooling around the kernel and around any software project, obviously. Uh, and uh, we use them religiously, but making the tools smarter is not a bad thing. And I, to some degree, compare it to writing things in assembly, which literally I started doing with the initial kernel was, I think, about 50% assembly language and using a compiler. And, and using smarter tools is just the next inevitable step. So that's going to happen, but I don't think it's necessarily the gloom and doom that some people say it is, and I definitely don't think it's the promised world that the people who are having their hand out for cash say it is. So uh, but, I, you need to be a bit cynical about this whole hype cycle in the tech industry. I hope yeah. you all realize that. It be, before AI, it was crypto. Before crypto, it was whatever. It's, it's a cloud native. Cloud yeah. native. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> there is a loud voice in the front. That's not hype. OK. I um, mean, the hype, there's always like a grain of reality behind it. But you need to be careful about all the BS around that grain. You that. can't say BS. Um, so, uh, so the beautiful science is what he meant. Yes. Um, so, <laughs> the I look at these tools and I look at you said assembler, 
And then we talk about compilers. Then we talk about things like Sparse, a compiler that tries to find certain kinds of bugs. We talk about Julia to do code refactoring. We have had, for the last 30 plus years, a sequence of tools that helped make development better and more robust. Yeah. And in, in that lineage of things, I, I, I hope there is really cool stuff coming down. Yeah, I mean, um, we have tools that do kernel rewriting uh, with very complicated scripts and pattern recognition and things like that. And, and that is actually literally why I think uh, AI can be a huge help because some of these tools are very hard to use because you have to specify things at a low enough level that the natural reaction would be to, hey, can we make this a bit easier and automate more of it? Uh, so, so yes. I. One, one of the interesting angles that this whole large language model and, and the, the training data brings up is the role that data plays in, in our modern world, where it, we all talk about open source, about the source code, the algorithms being available, but open data really is kind of that the, almost the more interesting question. No, today. it's not. Well, I mean, <laughs> it's not to me, and, and actually, I'd like to clarify that, I mean, the LF obviously has open data projects, and to other people it's more interesting. And that is, I think, the whole, for me, the point of open source is that different people are interested in different things. And, and uh, I was always interested in the low-level nitty-gritty of how the CPU actually works, which is why I'm working on the kernel still. But, uh, but yes, you're right that in many situations, what is important is the, is the data that you then use to generate pattern, find patterns and generate new interesting information with. But, but to me, that, that's not what I tend to do. And, yeah, there and, is that saying, beautiful science in, beautiful science out. Mm -hmm. Please translate. Um, so uh, you, you talk about the things that you love doing. And I want to point out, it's been more than a decade since you started a project. And the world is kind of getting a little antsy. So where is the next Linus Torvalds project? Oh, no. Uh, I hope it never happens. Uh, and I say that because every single project I've started has always started from me being frustrated with other people being incompetent. Uh, so. <laughs> Or money grabbing, right? <laughs> so the reason I started doing Linux was that I couldn't afford the real thing, right? And, and I said, how hard can it be? And it turns out it can be pretty hard, because here I am 33 years later and, and still working on it. But uh, I made the same mistake then, it's 20, plus, 20 years ago, when I said, hey, I really don't think source control management is very interesting. And all these people before me, they clearly got it completely wrong. So, so I need to do my own. How hard can it be? Uh, and I'm actually hoping to never be in that situation again, uh, that, that there will be somebody else who comes and solves my problems. And I have to say, uh, I don't have any huge problems. Uh, Linux, for me, solved all the problems I had way back in 92, maybe 93. Uh, and and it, if it wasn't for the fact that others came around and said, hey, I need this, I would not have continued. So, so while my projects start with something that I need, the things that actually keep them going and then is then the fact that, hey, this is actually useful to other people because if it's only something for me, it's not really interesting in the long run. So unfortunately, we're out of time. I had a lot more fun questions. I guess I will have to ask you those in Hong Kong. Uh, but for here, for Seattle, thanks, everyone. I hope this was fun. All right.